something like we're never going to get it through a chapter. So, turn, take your Bible and turn to Mark chapter 8. We're going to be in verses 22 to 26. Beginning with verse 22. Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house saying, Neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, thank you for this passage. It tells us a very vital truth. One that we, for the last several weeks, probably several months, we have seen the fact that the disciples, as Mark puts it down in his gospel, have hard hearts and they are not easily convinced. So even after the miracles that Jesus has done, they're still not convinced. And then we saw last week that Jesus pretty much laid it out in front of them and told them, all the things I've done, do you not understand? And today, Father, we see this passage as he illustrates for them that they should believe because of what they've seen. But blessed are those who believe and have not seen. Bless our time we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I entitled this the further awakening of the disciples because as I, my wife asked me about this, my son has asked me about this, I hope you see that the disciples are much like we are or were. It's hard for us to believe some things. Even when, you know, people say seeing is believing. No, the scriptural idea is believing is seeing. It's amazing what we can see now on this side of the cross that we couldn't see when we were on the other side. So disciples are gradually beginning to get it. Because look at verse 27. And I'm not going to get into that yet because Jesus and his disciples go to Caesarea Philippi and while they're walking there, he asked them, Who do men say that I am? And of course, the answers they give him, John the Baptist, raised from the dead. Some say Elijah, others one of the prophets. And then Jesus asked the pointed question, Who do you say that I am? And of all of the disciples... Simon Peter said, you are the Christ. Now in Matthew, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. It finally happened, but it took some time. And this illustration today of this blind man is another way of Jesus getting his disciples to see the real truth. So as we look at that, well, we remember last week Jesus asked questions of his disciples, asked them nine questions that would help them see clearly that he was and is the Christ, the Son of the living God. They're beginning to see more and more. They're like the blind man. Their eyes can see a little bit, but not very much. They're not quite there. And this miracle is going to be the thing that helps them see clearly who Jesus is. Mark is showing us this through the eyes of Peter. How much like the disciples we are. Mark was not one of the twelve, but Peter was. And obviously Mark got much, if not all, of his information from Peter when he put together this gospel. That's why we see the struggle of the disciples as much as we do. Because we're seeing this whole thing from Peter's perspective. And we know how up and down his life was. 
So Mark is writing from the perspective of one who was with Jesus his whole ministry. And when Jesus asked the disciples who he is, it is Peter who takes the initiative to say what had most likely become clear to all of them except perhaps Judas. I don't know how many of us have heard the gospel once and that's all it took for us to come to Christ. Because I have been asked the question, should anyone hear the gospel twice until everybody's heard it once? That's a good question. But the good news is God is in control of that. Not me, not you, not anyone. We don't have the ability to come to Jesus on our own. If he didn't do like Jesus has done here, open the eyes line we never see Jesus said no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him and the disciples are being drawn to Jesus as Lord and Savior just like you and I were so let's consider the words of this passage and I pray we'll see the final step in the awakening of the disciples perhaps there's someone here this morning who is struggling with this oh you may give the outward appearance of saying yes I believe that Jesus is God but inside you're saying I'm just not convinced well I pray this will convince you just like it did the disciples five observations in this text it will help us see clearly who Jesus is let's look at the first one in verse 22 a blind man is brought to Jesus now Jesus and his disciples have come to Bethsaida. And what's interesting about this town is this is the home of Philip, Andrew, and Peter. All three of those men were from this area. It is on the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee. And being blind is not uncommon. Blindness was a common ailment in this time. Poor hygiene, poor education, and superstition caused blindness. We don't know if this man was born this way. It does not tell us. He could be blind because of an accident or simply a progressive illness. You say, well, Brother Keith, who brought this man to Jesus? Well, notice in your text, they did. Who is they? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, it's not the disciples and it's not Jesus himself. So they is the crowd of this village who cared about this man. And I thought about stopping right there and talking about how much we ought to care for our fellow man. We ought to. And Miss Carol looking at a 20-week-old fetus, that's my fellow man or woman will be. My, I think it was my mother had a, and I don't know who wrote the cartoon that came out of the Tampa Tribune years ago, where this person is praying, God, will you send us somebody to get rid of cancer, to find a cure for this disease once and for all? And God answers and said, I did, but you aborted them. The crowd from this village brings this man to Jesus because they know who Jesus is and what he's capable of. He is a healer. Now maybe that's all they think about it. He's just one who goes around and heals people. But we know the reason behind this healing. Because you see this is a picture of most of us. We are blind or were blind to the things of God because of sin. The Old Testament talks about that. We could not see our way clear. So someone brought us to Jesus. I could spend the rest of this time asking who brought you to him. Because that's a fantastic story right there. Maybe it was a parent. I remember getting in the pickup truck when I was probably eight or nine years old at my grandmother's house in Chipley, Florida. 
and she came up to the door and asked me the question I hated to hear anybody ask me. Jesus, uh, she said, Keith, have you accepted Jesus as your Savior yet? And I didn't know what to say, so I said, no. And I had not And any time I got around someone that was evangelistic, I didn't like it. Stay away from me. I don't want to hear. I go to church, that's good enough. Well, it wasn't good enough. blind to the things of God. I remember, and you remember church training, which you used to have on Sunday night? I remember being one of the leading students in our church because I could memorize more scripture. I knew the answer to who was Moses' father and mother. You don't know the answer to that? Some would say Mr. and Mrs. Moses. No, that's not it. Amram and Jochebed were the parents of now which one was which I'm not sure but it was things like that because we often played this is before trivia even came to be a thing we often did that on Sunday nights just going to the Bible and asking questions to see who knew the most and I remember being one of the top students in that but I was lost as I could be My mother prayed for me. My Both of my grandmothers prayed for me. And I'll go ahead and tell you this from experience. When your grandparents and your mom prays for you, you might as well throw in the towel because you're going to lose. Or a relative. I had relatives that bombarded me with this question when I was around them or even friends of people that I might have called friends but the bottom line is it was the Holy Spirit of God who finally got me and he got me too yes sir I remember those yes sir yes sir you had to find it real quick didn't you and there were rules to follow yes sir if you moved many is it one time you were disqualified you had to do it the right way you have to know this book and man we have lost that we really have but who brought you to Christ I'm not saying who saved you because I know the answer to that but who brought you to Christ did you ever thank him I thank the Holy Spirit regularly for opening my eyes but let's go on number two not only is the blind man brought to Jesus in verse 22 but the blind man is separated from the crowd by Jesus you see that in the first part of verse 23 now here Jesus is showing us his compassion for the man so taking him away from the crowd will help him deal with seeing privately because we don't know how long he's been blind I've never been blind. I don't guess any of you have either. But can you imagine not seeing for months or years or maybe all of your life and then all of a sudden you can see? I'm telling you, this would shock you. So taking him away from the crowd would help him deal with this seeing privately. The shock of seeing light after being in darkness can frighten you. And just to give you a silly illustration, I'll emphasize the word silly. Years ago when we lived in Missouri and I worked for a farmer, uh, one of his friends had pigs. And I'm talking lots of pigs. They were all about this long. Just the cutest things you ever seen. And they were raised inside of a hog house. And when we tried to load them up, as soon as they saw the light, uh uh so we often had to break the old wives tale that pigs can't fly they actually can <laughs> now we were gentle with them of course but, but it's the same way with us if we haven't seen anything for many years and then all of a sudden bam there it is it would frighten us so Jesus knows what it's going to take for the man to realize what's happened and I read this in a commentary the other day. Good doctors and good teachers have to get into the mind of their patient. 
And think about if it's a little child that can't tell you what's wrong with you. That's one reason I admire veterinarians. Because I've never talked to a veterinary, a doctor of veterinary medicine yet that said that animal talked to them. Because if they did, I probably wouldn't take my little dachshund to them. But what I'm saying is a, doc, a good doctor is going to try to get into your mind to experience what you're experiencing so he can fix it, if at all possible. And the problem is Jesus is more than a good doctor. And I, I, I just want to mention this in passing. Jesus does not need a crowd to do what only he can do. Sometimes a crowd does not help. Especially in the case of healing. Doctors often deal, well when you go to the doctor's office, what do they do with you? They put you in a room by yourself. Don't they? And then they flip those little colored things out so the doctor will know that's where I'm supposed to go next. And you sit in there by yourself until he or she comes in there. Don't you? All by yourself. Privately. Jesus does this knowing what a crowd would do. What would they do? They would sensationalize this event. They would make a big deal out of the healing rather than the healer. And that's what crowds often do. And Jesus was a healer, but healing had a greater purpose because it often pointed to a problem, a spiritual problem that only Jesus could heal. I know the scripture says, when talking about the Lord Jesus that by his stripes we are healed but folks that is healing from sin not sickness well we can claim that if we want to the point that I'm making is this you might have cancer you might be like Barb Stanky that called me last night and said they've given me two weeks to live from Friday a week ago and I said, Barbara, knowing you, you're going to put them all to shame. But she doesn't have long. That's for sure. A spirit problem that only Jesus could heal. Not the physical thing. I had a friend of mine in seminary tell me one time, or asked me to pray for his father-in-law. He said, now he's not a Christian, so he's got cancer. He said, but I don't want you to pray about the cancer. I want you to pray about his healing from sin. Because if you die of cancer and you're a child of God, guess what? It's not going to stop you from living eternally, is it? No, sir. No, sir. But let's go on. Number three, the, this initial touch only brings the man to see unclearly. That's in the second part of verse 23 and verse 24. Now some theologians that I read, not very many, uh, refer to this healing as a two-stage healing. I don't agree with them. There's a reason for this. The fact that Jesus touches the man's eyes twice. But see, that just doesn't fit in with Jesus' normal way of healing, if you can even call it normal. Remember, Jesus takes this man outside of town. Bethsaida is not a very big area. He takes him outside of town. Guess who goes with him? All 12 of them. Including Peter. Because if they hadn't gone with him, then Peter couldn't have told Mark about the miracle. So these guys, these 12 guys are around Jesus watching what he does. And Jesus does very similar in this situation to the healing of the deaf mute man that's earlier in this gospel, the end of chapter 7. Now, the, don't get grossed out on me, please, folks. This was a common thing. 
he spit on the man's eyes. Now, I don't think it means he grabbed him and <laughs> right in his face. I think he spit on his fingers and put them on his eyes. Because a blind man can hear and he can talk, but he can't see. And if you go to put your hands on him and he can't see, when you touch him, he's going to know somebody touched him. I mean, that's evident. Even though many during this period of time, I, I mentioned earlier that they were very superstitious, they believed that saliva had healing properties. Now, I'm not sure that I totally agree with that because I don't want to go to my doctor and her spit on her hand and do anything. I just don't want that to happen. Uh, now, I'll let my little dog lick me in the face because I think that heals. That really does. <laughs> But just so you don't get the wrong idea, Jesus spitting on his fingers, there's no magic involved into this, either white or black or whatever you want to call it. It's not magic. So he touches the man's eyes with his fingers, and as I mentioned, the blind man would know that someone was touching him. He could not see who the someone was. And then Jesus asked the man if he saw anything. He's never done that before. Ah, hang with me. What does the guy say? I'm telling you this literally how it appears in the Greek text. I see men to me like trees walking around. Now this leads me to believe that he had been able to see at one time. I mean, a blind person can go up to a tree and become a tree hugger and tell you kind of what the trunk looks like. But that's it. They don't know any of the rest. Of it. Either disease or an accident it caused him to lose his sight. But it is possible, I will say this, that the man knew what a tree looked like just simply because of touching it. So I'm not saying my conclusion is irrefutable. But this is what I want to get you to see. Remember, the disciples are watching. They're watching what he does. And the man is a picture of their gradual awakening. They did not see it first. You remember what happened after the miracle of feeding the 5,000, which probably were a lot. 5,000, that's all that were counted with just men. It said because of their hard heart, they just didn't get it. And then after feeding the 4,000, Mark says something similar. So they don't get it at all. But there's a gradual awakening to this is not normal. This is not what healers do. They did not see it first, but as time goes on, and Jesus asking those questions last week, they're beginning to see who Jesus is. Because you see, they're like the blind man in that they see, but not clearly. Now, if, if I could show you this, I would, but you are all very clear to me because I have corrective lenses, but if I take them off, Y'all have no idea what you look like. You still look the same. Don't get me wrong. They're like the blind man and they see, but not clearly. And then I had to ask myself, did, did any of us see Jesus clearly at first? I can tell you from experience. I know more about Jesus Christ today than I did a week ago and a year ago and ten years ago and on and on because as I study the scriptures and read them it becomes more and more real and I firmly believe that when I get to heaven I won't have to ask where he is I'll know him and you will too perhaps we're like Saul on the road to Damascus. You remember what happened to Saul? Jesus told him, you're persecuting me. And Saul asked, but well, who are you? I'm Jesus. Oh. 
So when we read the book of Acts, we find out from the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 until Paul's journey on the road to Damascus several chapters later, the Holy Spirit is gradually, slowly opening his eyes to who Jesus is. Because you see, when Stephen was stoned, the scripture says the guys that threw the rocks took their coats, their cloaks, and they laid them in, in Saul's arm. He held the cloaks of those who stoned Stephen to death. And he heard everything Stephen said. Lord, don't lay this sin against them. I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. Why did Jesus stand up? Because we're told elsewhere he was sitting. Well, perhaps, I don't know that this is true, but perhaps he stood and looked over like this. Yep, that's my son, Stephen. Or perhaps he was sitting, and when that time came, he stood to his feet to honor the very first person to give their life for the gospel. Oh, my you know how that affected the apostle? Well, it wasn't the apostle then, was he? Saul? I can just imagine for however long it took from that time until his Damascus Road experience, every time he closed his eyes, he saw Stephen. And the Holy Spirit just kept driving that into his mind. Perhaps we were like that. I, I know very well, even when I was quoting Scripture, I didn't know who Jesus really was. But that brings us to number 4 in verse 25. The final touch brings complete healing. Notice, Jesus again lays his hands on the man. Again. And he has him look up. <laughs> Is that, is there a reason for that? I don't know. <laughs> Could be. But when he did, he began to see clearly. But this is my point. It didn't happen all at once. It was a progressive healing. Now I just imagine, I don't know, but perhaps Jesus, when he went to touch the man's eyes the second time, he turned to his disciples as if to say, Do you not see who I am? Do you not see it? They have seen him feed thousands with just a small amount of food. They have seen him walk on the water. They have seen him heal demon-possessed men and women and heal those who could not hear or see. So the question hits us between the eyes, folks. Who can do these things except God? John 10, 25, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he said this, I told you and you do not believe because they ask him, who are you really? Tell us plainly. And Jesus says, I told you, but you don't believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. What does bear witness mean? That means they testify of me. They tell you who I am because no one else can do that kind of thing. Jesus' works prove who He is. And that's still true today. Now listen real closely to what I'm about to tell you. If somebody ever asks you, prove to me that God exists, or prove to me that Jesus is who He says He is, you don't need to answer them. Just quote Scripture. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It does not matter what their preconceived ideas are. Just use Scripture. We do not need to prove who Jesus is to anyone. 
Now, if a person reads the gospel and says, well, I can't believe he walked on water. I can't believe he opened the eyes of the blind. I can't believe the yada, yada, on and on and on. Then what's it going to take for you to believe? If he suddenly appeared in front of you with the white robes like we see in paintings and so forth, you still wouldn't believe. I mean, just a few weeks back, the scribes or the Pharisees came and said, give us a sign. Isn't that what the disciples have been saying to themselves? Give us a sign. Show us who you are. What do you want me to do? You don't have to prove who Jesus is to anyone. He has done this by what he did. And folks, this has yet to be proven false. And it's not going to happen. Let me say it like we understand in O'Brien. It I mean, when you look at it, they brought the man to Jesus. That's it. <laughs> Jesus said, okay, I got him. You go about your business. I'll take care of this. He took him outside of town. The crowd stayed behind. It wasn't designed for them. Well, that tells us a lot, does it? Signs, wonders, miracles, all these things that some people claim happen today when all we need is is this book. You say, well, you don't believe in miracles? Certainly I do. Every time a child is born, it's a miracle. Every time a person is born again, it's a miracle. It's a miracle of grace. Jesus doesn't want this miracle to be sensationalized. It was not designed for the crowd. You say, well, Brother Keith, who was it designed for? I'm so glad you asked because I'm about to tell you. Number one, it was designed for three people. Number one, the disciples. They needed to see. You are seeing me like a tree walking around. Your sight is very unclear. You need to pray for the Spirit to open your eyes to see me clearly. To be the final proof that Jesus is God. They're like me. Hard to convince. And then number two, who else was the miracle for? Well, it was for the guy that was blind. He couldn't see who Jesus was or what Jesus did. Now he knew from experience. That man touched my eyes and I could see. You say, well, who's the third group? You and me. Does this not prove to any discerning heart that Jesus is God? Do you want proof that there's God? Read the Bible. The Bible never tries to prove that God exists. It just says he does. But then scientists and theologians have got together and we've come up with some pretty good arguments. Did you know that in Papua New Guinea... Adultery is wrong. To a tribe that has never heard of, never seen a white man, they said adultery was wrong. Who told them that? Or murder? Who do you think put it in their heart? Didn't Paul say that in Romans chapter 1? The law written on their hearts. Who wrote it there? 
God Almighty when they were perhaps 20 weeks old, Miss Carol. What happens when we pop out of the womb, then everybody tries to tell us at school, on the job, and everywhere else that there is no God. Our leaders of our government sometimes don't even believe that. Well, there's coming a day when the Lord Jesus Christ will step out into the clouds and He's going to call us home and they will know there is a God. But it will be too late. Just like the the rich man in the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Oh no, Father Abraham, send somebody back to tell my brothers not to come to this awful place. What did Abraham say? They got Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Oh no, 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 no. You send somebody back from the dead and they'll hear it. It's already happened. And we won't listen. If Jesus is God, this is my point then we are obligated to do what he says because we don't belong to us. I have done several funerals since I've been at O'Brien. I did quite a few even before that. And folks, you know what it tells me when they wheel that casket in there and they open it up and people come by and they see the last glimpse of that loved one? You know what it tells me? I can't control that. But he can. So if he's God, and he is, we better do what he says. And he tells us to repent and believe. That's what you do. If you don't know what repent means, it's like an about face. You're going this way. You're going towards the world. You're going towards your own way. You're going the path of sin. You turn an about face, and you walk towards God. That is repentance. When a person comes down here and says, I'm laying my cigarettes on the altar to give them to God, and then they turn around and two weeks later they go and buy another pack, they haven't repented. Let me give you an example of one who has repented in Scripture, and it just it's in my mind all the time. That was King David. When he saw that beautiful woman bathing on the rooftop, sin had her brought to himself. He's the king. He can do whatever he wants to. He has sex with her. She becomes pregnant with his child. And then he tries to cover it up. And Nathan the prophet is the one who brought it to a conclusion and told David, you are the man. You've done this. What's the first words out of David's mouth? I have sinned against the and the scripture never records of David doing that again. That is repentance. You say, well, Brother Keith, I've tried to repent. Well, what you got to do instead of trying is leave it to God to grant you repentance. Because it is granted. And then after that, after you repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you become a new person from the inside have you seen someone that's recently been born again? It's written all over their face, isn't it? Not words. It's just something there. And then you have a lifetime to do the other things he told us. But if one will not repent and believe in Jesus for the saving of their soul, they will stand before God guilty and with no hope. Sin has caused us to resist the Holy Spirit. But I'm telling you from experience if he's knocking on the door of your heart this morning, you better let him have his way. All that come to Jesus for salvation will be saved. But we have to come. And that doesn't mean walking down this aisle. Because if you think that I am Jesus, you need to go talk to my wife. There are days, there are times when I act as contrary to the Lord Jesus Christ as anybody could. And he does not let me wallow in that either. Perhaps you can identify with that. Are you beginning to see who he is? 
the disciples are beginning to see who Jesus is. And if we will but look, we'll see who he is also. That's my prayer for all of us today. When we see him, nothing is the same. He changes us, as I said, from the inside out. And that's what we need because, folks, you can go to a rehab center. You can go to a correctional facility. They can't change your heart. But Jesus Christ can and will. I was told by a police officer in Richmond, Missouri, that there's never been a record of a sexual offender being rehabilitated in the United States of America by the present current methods. But I'm here to tell you, when Jesus changes a heart, it changes everything else too. May God have his way with us now and in the future. That's who Jesus is. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for these words that you have given us. Thank you for your precious word that helps us to see where we stand with you. And Lord, perhaps there's someone here whose eyes have, well, they've not been fully opened. Lord, God, would you open them today? They don't even have to tell us about it. We'll know. We'll know. Because it's not long after this when Jesus asked, Who do people say that I am? And Peter cannot wait to say, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Father, may we say that now and forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Each